rapper and CEO of Bad Boy Entertainment, Puff Daddy! Bad Daddy! Now, who's hot, who's not? Tell me who rock, who sell out yeah. the stores? Tell me who flop, who caught the blue drop? What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. The American rapper Mace was born around the mid to late 70s to the home of PK Betha and Mason Betha. He didn't just come alone. He had a twin who was born just minutes after him. Mace was born originally as Mason Jarrell Betha and hailed from Jacksonville, Florida. Mace had a huge family. However, like a lot of American rappers, his father left when he was just a child. Finding it hard to keep up as a single parent in Jacksonville, Mace's mother moved him to the tough neighborhood of Harlem, New York. The change of environment brought a shift in Mace's life as he morphed into his teens. Harlem was where he spent a significant part of his childhood. In this new environment, Mace became quite popular on the streets of Harlem, and it wasn't for the best of reasons. He occasionally got into trouble. It got so bad that his mother had to take him out of the community as a whole and send him back to his birthplace in Jacksonville where he lived with his relatives. This was a great move for Mace because while he was in Jacksonville, Florida, he started attending church for the first time in his life. He returned to Harlem around the age of 15. Upon returning to Harlem, he began showing a keen interest in basketball and he joined his school basketball team at Manhattan Center High School. I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. I moved to New York when I was about five years old. Went to school at Manhattan Center, PS 92, junior high school 43. During his basketball years, he played for his school team alongside his friend Cameron Giles, who later became a rapper with the stage name Cameron. After he finished high school, he moved to the State University of New York to pursue a basketball scholarship. While attending the State University of New York, Mace's attention began drifting from basketball into music. He started focusing on writing music, producing demo tapes, and performing regularly at local nightclubs. When he finally realized that he had no chance of making it into the NBA, he quit both school and basketball to pursue a career in music. This didn't go down well with his mother. During an interview with Rolling Stone, May said the following. She wasn't okay with that at all, but she always respected my decisions. And I just told her that this was my dream. After Mace returned to Harlem, he began rapping with his friend Cameron. During this time period, they briefly formed a group which was called Children of the Corn. Mace and Cameron were group members Murder Mace and Killer Cam, alongside fellow Harlem rappers Big L, Herb McGruff, and Bloodshed. During the group's short lifespan, Damon Dash was their manager. However, the group disbanded later on. Around 1996, his twin sister Stacen introduced him to Kuda Love around the mid to late 90s. Kuda Love was the road manager for the Notorious B.I.G. at the time. After meeting Kuda, Mace began to prosper. In a fortunate turn of events, Kuda took Mace to a rap convention in Atlanta, Georgia. It was there that Mace got a chance to audition for Puffy after the convention. After listening to Mace rap, Diddy was immediately impressed. So much so that Mace backed a $250,000 deal with Bad Boy Records. Puff was like the first person I ever met that sees things the same exact way. Like a lot of people look at me like, he's overdoing it, he worked too hard, or he want things too perfect. I just want, to me, perfect is the right way. And I don't settle for nothing, and I, it was just amazing to meet somebody else that don't settle like that. After signing the deal, he had to switch his stage name from Murder Mace to Mace for better marketability. Unlike a lot of artists who get signed to a label and drop an album immediately, this wasn't the case for Mace. His official mainstream career started by doing many features. Among the numerous features includes 112's Only You with Notorious B.I.G. He also appeared on many hit songs with other bad boy artists, including Puffy's Can Nobody Hold Me Down. Can nobody take my pride? Uh -uh, uh -uh. Can nobody hold me down? Oh no. And being around the world. 
And notorious B.I.G.'s more money, more problems. Mace also appeared on other singles such as Just The Way You Like It by Tasha Holiday. And You Should Be Mine by Brian McKnight. The stage was set. The features Mace produced helped him generate a considerable buzz. After much waiting, Mace finally came out with his debut album called Harlem World. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, selling about 175,000 copies in the first week. Maze had finally arrived. When you think of Harlem World, Harlem World is just something I put together. Because all I knew all my life was Harlem. You know, once I went around the world with Pub, I just saw that it was other people that loved me as much as the people from Harlem. So I bring it all together like one unified nation due to all the negativity and just came up with Harlem World. The album spawned three very impressive singles, namely Feel So Good. Looking at me. Hit you with the ice grill, you know. And what you want. All three singles listed above did exceptionally well on the charts. 1997 was truly a great year for Mace. When Harlem World came out, hip hop was still recovering from the deaths of Tupac and Biggie. Tupac passed away in 96. Big in early 97, and Harlem World dropped around October 97. It was a very defining moment for Mace. Could Bad Boy's Heir to the Throne deliver an album that met expectations was the question on a lot of people's minds. When the album dropped, Mace proved everybody wrong, delivering an album that not only exceeded expectations sales-wise, but created a moment in hip-hop. One that is still in full effect to this day. If you think about it, about every artist that featured on the album went on to have a successful career. Busta Rhymes, The Locks, DMX, Ed Bowen, MJG, and the list goes on. They all received a lot of exposure from this album. Also thanks to Puffy's guidance, Mace became an artist that genuinely catered to his female audience and paved the way for artists like Loon, Fabulous, and even Drake to have a career. What made my style unique in this game is that I'm real laid back. A lot of guys are laid back, but I'm laid back and hyperactive at the same time. A lot of people be nonchalant, but they be nonchalant and boring but not nonchalant with energy, so that's a new style. Harlem World is heavily infused with R&B. For the most part, Mace's lyrical delivery is smooth and simplistic. The project isn't bar heavy, but rather one that provides listeners with a good time and insight into the distinct life of a man who was raised in Harlem. Now around 1998, Mace appeared on songs such as Top of the World with Brandy, and take me there with Maya and Blackstreet. He also appeared on a song called Horse and Carriage alongside Cameron, one we shall discuss in a moment. Now it's safe to say that Cameron's career might not have taken off without Mace's influence. After Children of the Corn broke up, Cameron decided to try his hand at basketball once again. His basketball career was going nowhere, but luckily he had Mace in his corner. In the 90s, Mace strategically took Cameron to Biggie's house, hoping the meeting of lyrical minds would be fruitful. And it was. At the time, Cameron was trying to get a record deal with a major label, and knew that if he impressed Biggie, he would have an opportunity to achieve that dream. Cameron freestyled in Biggie's presence for 25 minutes, and by the end of the freestyle, Big was so impressed that he co-signed the up-and-coming rapper. Big then introduced Cameron to record label owner Lance on Rivera, and soon after that, Cameron got signed to Lance's label. You know, these guys from the Brooklyn pimping. take the money, because mm -hmm. me and Cam, we played basketball together. We cried when we lost together. I knew him when he had the flat top. You know, he knew me when I had the ball head. We was, you know, 110 pounds. So we knew each other way, way back. So it was really like, I helped him get his deal. I got him his deal. I got him the 600 that he first had, you know, so a lot of things that I've done. Was that with The Rock or was that with Epic? No, that was with, that was with Undias. Through Cameron's new deal, he was able to release his debut album called Confessions of Fire. The album was a success, 
debuting at number 6 on the Billboard 200 and selling over 100k in the first week. Another interesting thing of note is Maze was on the project, appearing on the controversial Horse and Carriage song. He also appeared on another song called F*** You and another song called We Got It. Many people believe the Horse and Carriage song is where the beef between Maze and Cameron began. After noticing how hot the track was, Cameron wanted to shoot a video for it and wanted Maze to make an appearance for the video shoot. With his money on his mind, Maze asked Cameron to pay about 40 grand for his appearance in the video, angering the pink t-shirt wearing MC. Because Cameron wasn't about to pay $40,000 for Maze's appearance, he decided to use a body double instead. This was not the last time the two MCs had issues. Now around 1998, Maze formed his own record label called All Out Records. It was there that he signed his group Harlem World, a group that also signed a production deal with JD So So Def Records. But we'll talk about that later in the video. In the same year, Mace and Jay-Z traded a lot of subliminal lines at each other. What may have caused this tension between the two rappers, you may ask? Well, the answer is very simple. Like a lot of rap beef, this one started because of a woman. Now, it appears Mace had a habit of sleeping with other people's girls because this time he slept with Arion, a woman who was dating a member of Rockefeller at the time. This move did not sit well with Jay-Z or Dame Dash. They took it as a blatant sign of utmost disrespect and took on the beef for their defrauded Rockefeller member. Arion appeared in a Harlem World skit called Phone Conversation. It was a girl. She liked me. We did whatever we did. And it was somebody's girlfriend that was in Jay-Z's crew. So then, me and Dame get into it. Dame wanna box me. I tell him, let's box. We didn't end up boxing. Everybody broke it up on 125th. Because Jay was loyal to Rockefeller at the time, he inherited the beef. I guess Jay inherited it because me and him never really had a problem. He said something, I said something back and that was about it. During this time period, it appears Mace wasn't very fond of rappers who constantly bragged about their money in excess. Especially rappers that didn't have many platinum hits. At the time, Jay-Z was not the platinum hit-selling artist that he is today, so this was definitely a dig at Jay. All we hear is platinum that, platinum this. Platinum whips, nobody got no platinum hits. Jay-Z also fired back with a couple of subliminal shots on Ride or Die, a track off his 90s classic, Volume 2, Hard Knock Life. Shocked when I got the news that this ready for war. Well, where the fool at? Jay-Z also had another more vicious rhyme that reads as follows. Always gotta be the weakest out the crew. I probably make more money off your album than you. You see the respect that I get every time I come through. Check your own videos, you'll always be number two. Now according to Mace, the beef with Jay-Z wasn't very serious. It was merely a sparring competition between competitors and nothing more than entertainment. I don't know, me and Jay never really had no problems like that. I know some things that were said could be taken certain ways, but we never had no problems. At least not to my knowledge. I don't get into record beef. That's the wackest beef. That's not even a beef. That's entertainment. Might as well be a wrestler or something. I never had a problem with him because I never seen him and he did anything to me. And I never had to do anything to him. Thankfully, the beef between Jay-Z and Mace did not escalate beyond subliminal bars. Um, that was based on a young young lady named Arion that I put in a skit. Mm -hmm. And it was it was done really harmlessly at the time I was 19 years old. So I was just, you know, trying to create a vibe and and show people what Harlem was like, you know, from a real Harlem perspective. And it's just, you know, she got she wanted to do it. So I let her do it at the time. I didn't know she was, you know, one of his guys, baby moms or something like mm -hmm. that. She did it. I didn't make her do it. She did, she did it. And then after that. He got me and Dame into issues, and then Jay Z just really inherited, you know, mm -hmm. what Dame did, mm -hmm. and then after that point, it just escalated from there. The following year, Mace released his second album called Double Up. The album peaked at number eleven on the Billboard 200 and sold about 107,000 copies within the first week. On this album, Mace's lyrics toughened up and became more aggressive. The album spawned singles such as Get Ready featuring Blackstreet. And all I ever wanted. Now this is where things get a little bit odd. The same year after the release of his second album, Mace decided to leave the music industry and pursue a career as a pastor. I cannot make this up. 
Speaking further on why he left the music industry at the time, he said the following: leading people, friends, kids, and others down a path to hell. Clearly, Mace felt like the path he had taken in life was not following God. Now it's time for me to serve God in His way. The Lord sends you messages when He's ready, and not necessarily when we are. Thank the Lord. <laughs> Amen. That means they didn't leave yet. Amen. I was laying on my bed yesterday, and the Lord said, "I'm I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming." I am coming as surely as you're laying here. I am coming. You better get your 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 tithing situation together. He's coming. Now, according to the members of Dipset, there's a deeper reason why Mace became a pastor, and it was to avoid street beef with Harlem gang member Baby Maine. Around that time, Mace made the unfortunate mistake of sleeping with Baby Maine's girl. And as a result, became a target of the Harlem drug dealer. According to sources, Mace begged for his life after getting caught with Baby Maine's girl and called Cameron to come to the rescue. Being the loyal man that he was at the time, Cameron came to Mace's aid and received a mere hundred dollars from the bad boy artist as a payment. Mace addressed the whole situation with Baby Maine on a song called "Jealous Guys," a song that appears on Harlem World. As to be expected, the song was incredibly disrespectful. It had lines such as, "Now would you be mad if I gave back your girl?" or "Would it still be a problem with the entire Harlem world?" At first, you were singing that she was your ex, but you was ready to kill me when you found out we had sex. Clearly, Mace did not know who he was messing with, because after the song dropped, there was an obvious outpour of anger from Baby Maine. Mace's life was now at risk. However, before Baby Maine could make a move, Mace left New York and moved to Atlanta. Taking drug dealer and member of his crew Pop Lottie with him, according to Cameron, Mace was a smart dude, one who benefited from the drama between his affiliate Pop Lottie and Baby Maine. According to sources, Baby Maine and Pop Lottie had tension before Mace screwed the former's girl. In an act that sounds like it came out of a 90s gangster movie, Baby Maine cut Pop Lottie in the face because Lottie owed one of Maine's friends money. Lottie narrowly got away with his life. However, he clearly harbored resentment because around 1999, he ended the life of Baby Maine. As the story goes, one of Maine's associates named Cardin had his chain taken by Baby Maine. That did not sit well with Pop Lottie. In an act of retaliation, Pop Lottie stole one of Baby Maine's cars and used it as bait, luring Maine out to a desired location where he killed the man in cold blood. Many people believe May somehow motivated Lottie to take out Maine. As if that was not enough, about a year after Maine died, one of Maine's people ended Lottie's life, contributing to the endless cycle of gang violence that takes place in New York City. I get there. He's standing in the middle of the gym floor. Nah, fuck that T. They gonna respect me. He took the little guy's car, Dan. Took his chain.、Mm. Nah, fuck that. But he didn't take it because he had anything against Cardan. He had something against Mace, and allegedly Mace disrespected him because I don't know if Mace used to talk to the, his baby's mother. And after she had Jermaine's baby, he was at the house. It was just something crazy, you know. And I don't know. I think Mace said something. I don't know if it, at this time the record had already came out that Mace said something on a record. So right, you're right. throwing shots, and um. Mace never came to get the chain, though. We ain't seen Mace since.、Mm. What do you mean you ain't seen him since? We ain't seen him since. He left New York or whatever. So, from my understanding, he took Pop Lottie down to Atlanta. Pop Lottie came back, and I guess I don't know if he threw the battery in these guys back to make it more intense. As far as that's how that whole thing. This was before Pop even shot Mace the five times. Mace had got with these guys, and I guess I don't know if he paid them or promised them anything. After witnessing the violence taking place around him, this was before Baby Mace got killed. Mace then decided to become a pastor, leaving the dangerous life of the streets behind him. Around 1999, he appeared in a song called "I Really Like It." During this same year, Mace's crew called Harlem World. Released an album called The Movement. The album debuted at number 11 on the Billboard 200 and eventually went gold. 
Singles like I Really Like It and Kelly Chronic held this album down. This is for the no nighters, six four riders, all the ones are low riders. Around the 2000s, Mace made an appearance on a Kanye West produced track called That's What's Happening alongside the mad rapper and Tracy Lee. For five whole years, Mace was off the scene. During this period, he returned to college to obtain a degree in psychology. He went about through his travels preaching God's word and became an ordained pastor. The public knew that Mace was back when he was featured in Nelly's In My Life and Fat Joe's remix of Lean Back in 2004. He also dropped a verse on Kanye's Jesus Walks remix in that year. Around 2004, Kanye released a college dropout. It contained a song called Through the Wire, one that has a few lines that reference the fight that took place between Mace and Ghostface Killer. If you could feel how my face felt, you would know how Mace felt. If you could feel how my face felt, you would know how Mace felt. Thank God I ain't too cool for the safe belt. As the story goes, Mace made disparaging statements about Wu Tang during a concert. After that, Mace and his crew bumped into Ghostface and his entourage in a New York City club. A fight eventually took place, one that left Mace with a broken jaw. Shit. I remember when I badmouthed Ghostface Killer at a show one time and I spent the next 6 weeks with my jaw wired shut. What an experience that was. You know, to be beat down so severely by a hip hop legend. After announcing the release of his Welcome Back album, Mace excitedly took to radio to do some promo. However, in a twisted turn of events, Cameron and Jim Jones called in during the show and brought Mace's dandling credibility into question. Why you don't tell the people the truth? Tell them the truth book. about what? Let's start with the book. You was fabricating the book. What's and fabricated about the book? My man published your money. I don't you own some money. You were telling saying people's name all in your book. Second of all, we went on the road with you, yeah, but we left because you wasn't giving us no money, so we went and got money. And right now, we the scissor boys. Caught a billion. You ain't heard? Man, I wasn't Bessa, giving y'all money. you on the line, Bessa? Yeah, that's me that's on the you, line. Bessa? Yeah, Where's me you, on the line. Where, you, you already know why you left Harlem. R.I.P. Baby Man and R.I.P. Pop Lottie. That's why you left Harlem. You ran up out of there, Bethel. I moved Where's your from congregation Harlem before at? that. Did you have a congregation in Atlanta? Did you leave your congregation down there? Or did no, you get sir. Which no, one, sir. Bethel? Because you're saying this is me. I don't care what you say on the radio, but this is me. I know you. I know don't, you too, don't, sir. Don't play with me, brother. Ain't nothing changed. You know, I put you in my Koofy category. Off with your Koofy. Don't play with me, man. Ain't nothing changed. God forgive Jimmy. What, what happened with... Tell the people what happened with Lottie. Did Lottie escort you out of Harlem before? Who's All right, I need to find out. Huh? Who's, who's wow. these, who are these people that would... Who are these... Maybe made a pop Lottie. Ask them about that, Miss Jones. Ask them why Who are they, Maze? I said what actually I believe to be truth to me, you know. Even from the things in Harlem, I'd already had a place in Atlanta. Mm. You know, so nobody made me leave. You know what I'm saying? I, I even addressed that in a record. A lot of things happen. But can I just say something? People get killed in Harlem all day. You know, like even when, when a friend of mine named Lottie got killed, it, it really had nothing to do with a chain. A chain was the, the end result of the beginning of it. One dude got cut. My boy Lottie got cut. So that started the problem. It was not... A chain that was taken. What started, he got cut. Then a chain was taken. Then he went to get the chain back. And a lot of things that transpired from that. And, you know, I, tr I took Lottie with me to Atlanta. He got born again. And, mm. I told, and I told him, don't go back to New York. Let's just chill, man. Let's just have a different life. In the same year, Joel Santana and Cameron dissed Mace on Cameron's Purple Haze album, appearing on a track blatantly titled take him to church. Everybody welcoming this, welcoming that. He wasn't welcome in the first place. How we welcome him back? Do Harlem a favor, get a church or something. After a few features indicating his re-entry into the music industry, he released his third studio album called Welcome Back. The album was released through Bad Boy and this time distributed by UMG. Welcome Back portrayed Mace in an entirely new light. His third album was his effort to come clean from his past music and identify with his new religion. Welcome Back debuted at number 4 on the Billboard 200 
and sold 188,000 copies in its first week alone. Welcome Back spawned some serious singles that performed massively well on the airwaves and the charts. For example, the album spawned singles like Welcome Back, and breathe stretch shake stretch shake let it go breathe stretch shake let it go both of which were certified gold by the RIAA the album also produced a third single called keep it on however it didn't do as well as the other singles overall the album was a success it managed to go gold eventually and spawned singles that captured a moment in time now despite the album's success, it did leave a lot of people very confused. Was Mace genuine about his new clean image? Forsaking his murder Mace persona entirely? Or was he faking it? The next move Mace made cleared a lot of things up for his fans. Around the early to mid 2000s, all evidence suggested that Mace was going to join G-Unit. He made an appearance alongside Young Buck on the Anger Management Tour and later made an appearance with Wu Kid on Sirius's G-Unit Radio, a place where he let the world know that his involvement with G-Unit was to be taken seriously. At the time, 50 was expanding the gang and introduced MOP and Mob Deep into the group. The only missing link was none other than the shiny suit-wearing artist, Mace. Luckily, Mace was shopping around for a new deal. It seems at this point it's gonna be on G-Unit. Mace made several appearances on G-Unit projects. One of his first appearances took place on 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying soundtrack, where he dropped a verse on I Don't Know Officer. On the track, Mace appeared alongside 50 Cent, Lloyd Banks, Prodigy, and Spider Loke, further establishing himself as a member of G-Unit in the eyes of the public. During his time with 50, Mace made other appearances on G-Unit mixtapes, including DJ Wu Kids, G-Unit Radio 13, making an appearance on 300 shots. He also had a catchy single on G-Unit Radio Part 14, back to business called Check Cleared. Check Cleared 1212. Check Cleared 1212. Maze had a song featuring 50 Cent called Kamikaze, which appeared on G-Unit Radio Part 15, Window Shopper. Now Maze did get to drop a full mixtape on G-Unit. The mixtape contained well-known songs like Window Shopper the Remix and Check Cleared. Maze also took several jabs at Dipset, Loon and Fabulous during this time period, but we'll get into that a bit later in the video. When Maze got on G-Unit, 50 was clearly trying to do everything in his power to make Maze blow up. However, he eventually found out that his efforts were in vain because of one man, P. Diddy. At this point in his career, Maze didn't want to be on Puffy's label anymore because he felt like Bad Boy Records didn't allow him to fully express himself musically. When I came back to Bad Boy, they didn't want me to go where I wanted to go with the music. They wanted me to do what was safe for them. I had to pretty much sabotage myself. Everyone knows who I am. According to Puffy, he was certain that 50 Cent had enough money to buy Maze out of his contract and was more than willing to see Maze go free if 50 Cent provided the funds. He's definitely got enough money to set everything right. 50 hasn't called me about signing Maze and if he's interested in signing him, we could always have a discussion. At the end of the day, I want everybody to be happy and where they want to be. But I'm available, I'm free, he's got my number. In my mind, Mace's appearance in 50 Cent's Window Shopper video made it official. Mace was signed to G-Unit. Mace also made a dope remix to Window Shopper. Again, when he appeared on the record, I had no doubt in my mind that he was G-Unit. However, I later came to find out that I was being misled. Mace did not sign a contract with G-Unit because he was still signed to Diddy. The truth is, Puffy wanted 50 to pay $2 million for Mace's contract, a price 50 was not willing to pay. I was like, what you looking for for that? He said 2 million. I'm like, Mace ain't worth 2 million with 2 million in his pocket. Are you crazy? This is right before we went on that G-Unit tour. The principle is more important. He was a million over what Depp was supposed to make. 
he could have made a million dollars out of it but he's saying two million we could have did it for the million dollars he could have got that back around 2005 mace made an appearance on little scrappy's full metal jacket where he dropped a verse on take a picture now let's go back to 2004 2005 for a bit during this time mace developed a beef with ex bad boy artist loon as the story goes Loon was once a member of Mace's crew called Harlem World. The group consisted of six members, namely Baby Stace, Mace's sister, Blinky Blink, Cardan, Huddy, Mino, Sugar J, and a then unknown Loon. Like most groups, they eventually split up, but not before releasing their debut album called The Movement in the late 90s, one that eventually went gold the following month. The last time the group made an appearance together on a track was on Double Up, where they appeared on a track called From Scratch. Now when Mace joined G-Unit, it left a lot of people confused. One of those confused souls was none other than Loon. When Mace joined G-Unit, Loon had some disparaging statements to make about Mace. I was basically like, that's my dude. But if dude feels G-Unit can save him from ridicule, which can definitely be a reality in the future, good luck. Loon's radio interview was clearly the spark that ignited the flame because Mace quickly fired back on a track called Return of Murder After hearing the Return of Murder, Loon fired back at Mace on wax on two cuts named You Not A Rider and You Heard I got what happened to Pastor out there on my own independently and it made its waves. Now that you've got Mace's music pushed by the G-Unit machine, even though my record was hotter, he's got visibility. I wanted people to hear my lyrical achievement. On the track called You Heard, Loon had a line that goes, Yo Pastor, I thought you seen the light, it just don't seem right. The world thought you had an epiphany. All you're doing is spending church money in Tiffany's. Mace took shots at Fabulous and Loon on a track called I Don't Know Officer, a song off the soundtrack for 50 Cent's 2005 film Get Rich or Die Trying. I don't know why Loon and Fabby won't just say I'm their daddy. Why them Harlem CB4 just keep coming at me. I don't know why Loon and Fabby won't just say I'm their daddy. Why these Harlem CB4 niggas just keep coming at me. At this point, everyone had a feeling that Fab's sound was influenced by Mace, making Mace's jabs very valid. Fabulous fired back at Mace on his street CD called Losa's Way, Rise to Power. The track of note is called Murder, We Don't Believe You. On the song Fabulous raps, Ayo hey, son, this simple. I pop up on them like one of his pimples, gun to his dimple. After dropping multiple lines at Mace, Fabulous clearly felt like he was the victor. He threw a jab and I threw a jab and uppercut. Fabulous also tried to assassinate Mace's career outside of the studio by claiming that Mace was only acting tough because he was affiliated with 50 Cent. I think Mace got caught up in trying to act like the people he's around. 50 Cent and them is known for taking jabs and saying wild, reckless stuff. I guess he felt like he had to jump in those shoes too. I just had to answer to it. Now around 2006, Loon dropped his second less successful studio album called No Friends. Naturally, the album contains a few jabs at Mace. On Live or Die, Loon raps, I'm from Harlem, no I'm different from Mace. Grip, squeeze the fifth, blow your shit out of place. I'm from Harlem, niggas know I'm different from Mace. Nigga, grip, squeeze the fifth, blow your shit out of place. Clearly, Loon was going at the fact that Mace was born in Jacksonville, Florida and not Harlem. Now, remember the second diss track Loon released called You Heard? Well, Loon renamed the track Nova, What Happened to Pastor, and placed it on his No Friends album. Needless to say, the album and diss track didn't get much traction. Now, according to Loon, Mace wasn't gangster at all. Mace didn't start cussing until 99 and simply acted tough because he kept himself around real G's. Additionally, when May started hanging around G when his murder mace persona mysteriously came back, Loon believes it was all an act. I was like, what? This is a dude that knows better. Maybe with new company around, he got some new jolts of courage. From the sound of things, Loon severely hated the fact that people compared his simplistic laid back flow to Mace's and felt like the public weren't giving him a chance to be an individual 
as he remained in the shadow of Mace throughout his entire career. Loon further stated that he's not trying to be an emulator of Mace at all. Basically, Mace is like doing what niggas do. You know what I'm saying? Niggas get around tough niggas and feel they gotta be tough. Or niggas get around fly niggas feel they gotta be fly. You know what I'm saying? That's basically it. You know what Mace is caught up in right now. He's confused. He thinks the niggas he with is tough. So he needs to be tough. When Mace murder was just an ego or an image that Harlem accepted on a lyrical basis. Son ain't murdered a motherfucking thing but a beat. His whole life. He just started cursing probably around 99. On everything. Nigga mother's a god fed woman. You know what I'm saying? Dude was born in Jacksonville, Florida, man. Nigga moved here when he was about five, six years old, man. I can tell you niggas pedigree. Him, Cam, all of niggas had hoop dreams. Niggas was not on the block doing none of this shit no one did. None of this shit no one did. But at the end of the day, how do you convince a nigga way out in Swamp Fox, Idaho, or Sheep Dick, Nebraska, that these niggas ain't those niggas? That is a pointless effort trying to convince people that has already, you know what I'm saying, endured their bullshit and inherited it and, and, and became a fan of it. But at the end of the day, dude is just really confused. He don't know what the fuck he's doing. Then again, he might think he know what he's doing, but at the end of the day, it's like, man, I'm not gonna play tennis with this nigga but for so long, you know what I'm saying? It's just a matter of time before I just put out that one record that just assassinates everything they do stand for. And then it's just a matter of time before I bump into this nigga in the flesh and knock half his motherfucking teeth out of his mouth. And then the shit would be solidified. It'd be justified. And at that point, niggas can get off my dick with that May shit. Because I've been ridiculed and shadowed by this man named my whole fucking career. You understand? My whole fucking career. The five year niggas was going, you corny ass niggas out there miss this nigga. Go find him. Don't keep trying to say loon sound like Mace or like loon this and loon that. You niggas got to stop trying to identify niggas with other niggas you know or whatever the case may be. Everybody's an individual. Clearly from this one line you could tell that Loon was tired of being compared to Mace. Hey yo, the next nigga ask about Mace getting punched in the face. It's not hate, I'm in an uncomfortable state. Around 2007, Young Buck released an independent project called They Don't Bother Me, with Mace making an appearance on the single of the same name. Around this time, Mace's involvement with G-Unit slowed down. After not being able to get out of his contract with Diddy, Mace eventually cut ties with 50 and moved on with his career. Now Jim Jones did apologize to Mace for all the pain that he caused him while they were beefing. After releasing his third album Welcome Back, Mace took another bow from the music scene again until around 2009. Like he did in the past, he returned by doing features. He appeared on the Harry O version of Uptown Boy, and also featured on a street remix of Drake's Best I Ever Had. Now around 2009, Cameron and Mace decided to put their differences aside and collaborated on a track called Get It. During a radio interview, Mace spoke about his reasons for returning to the rap game and claimed that he did it because Michael Jackson had passed away. I'm excited. Mike passed away. It lit a fire under me and made me want to go into the studio and do something. When speaking about the reason he chose to jump on a Drake record, he said the following. I asked my little nephew and said, who is the hottest thing out there? He said, Drake, Drake. I said, I gotta see what record he got. And I said, I'm going to jump on a joint. Now Mesa's first solo release was Thinking About You, a version produced by Ron Brown. Soon after that, he released another single called Shut the City Down. As far as releasing singles goes, he was on a roll, as he released another song called Radio soon after that. Radio was a prelude to his upcoming mixtape at the time, I Bleed Money. Now around 2009, Mace got Puffy to sign official paperwork 
when he showed up to a radio show unannounced while Puffy was on the air. Puffy was clearly not expecting Mace to show up. However, despite this, he signed Mace's paperwork right there and then. Now at this point, most people were confused. So Puffy had to explain what just took place. And he said the following. Just be clear, Mace has the freedom to do whatever he want to do. People felt like our situation, I may have stopped him or whatever, he can do whatever he want to do. I'm trying to make sure everyone is crystal clear. If you want those Mace verses, get your hustle on. He got a slick tongue though. He's a mean negotiator so you better come with that guap. Now after the show was over, Mace looked at the cameras and said, 10 years to get this paperwork right here. I had to put this in UPS. I don't want nothing to spill on it. I don't even know what I'm gonna put out now. Oh my goodness. We good. I got official papers right here from Puff Daddy. It was love. So I guess we don't have no problems after all. I don't even know how to take that. I ain't used to Puff doing good stuff. After Puff signing this official, your boy is Freedom Bird. I'm trying to get my paperwork signed. He's trying to get his freedom. And I ain't mad at him. So I'm going in bum rush puff on air. And let's really get this yeah. shit popping. No. And we're going to blog it right here on shutup.com. And you know I'm tweeting too. Mason Murder is in the building. Surprise. Murder Right now, Diddy is signing Mace's contract, allowing Mace to collaborate with whomever he wants. Now right in 2010, Cameron went at Mace once again. This time he called out Mace for missing Huddy's funeral and showing no remorse. Did Mace show for Huddy's funeral? Hell no, that f sucker ass. Cameron was clearly upset when Huddy died because the pair were extremely close. In fact, it was Huddy that saved Cameron when Cameron got shot twice while leaving a party in DC. Huddy was the one who spotted the assailant and took Cameron to the hospital. Now around 2012, Mace was doing his feature artist thing, appearing on tracks such as Slight Work alongside Wale, French Montana and Diddy. Get what you mace. want me say, what you yeah, want me do, different kind of money make different kind of moves, different kind of dudes with different kind of Jews. He also appeared on Young Harlem with Cash Flow, Awkward Moment with Adrian Marcel, and most notably Hire, an infectious track of Good Music's Cruel Summer album. It appears Mace was finally able to get out of his bad boy contract around 2012. I've been in that contract for 16 years. Yeah, the other day he let me out of it. So big shout outs to Diddy. I guess he woke up feeling good and he wanted to do something good. Now despite having a hard time getting out of his contract, May still showed love for Diddy. You know how Puff is. I love him but you gonna cut your arm off to get free. Clearly getting out of his bad boy contract was no easy feat. Now around 2013, Mace announced the potential release of a new album called Now We Even. He also released a lackluster single for the project called Why Can't We featuring her. No abbreviations, use hashtag Now We Even. That's the only conversation I'm having. Yes, Now We Even is the album title. Let's make it happen. Right now I'm listening to all my early freestyles and songs. This got to be something special. A couple of free shows and visits. Hashtag now we even. I'm listening also to Life After Death, All Eyes and Me, and Reasonable Doubt. Just so you know what I'm thinking. Hashtag now we even. Mace wanted to drop a song with Drake, Lauren Hill, 2 Chains, Seal, CeeLo Green, Diddy, Meek Mill, Beyonce, Fabulous, and even Dipset. 
He was truly ambitious to put together a solid project. However, despite his best efforts, his album failed to materialize. Mace also went on to address his issues with Cameron on IG. Cameron is home team, so no, we don't have any beefs. I can only comment on what is factually correct. Hashtag, now we even. Mace did more features around 2013, appearing on Grown Ups alongside French Montana and Rico Love. I want you out the hood for good, I want you on your feet. I want you be everything you thought you couldn't see. He also appeared on songs such as Made It Through the Struggle with Young Scooter and Ver Simmons. I made it through that struggle, 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 struggle. I grinded out that gutter, 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 gutter. He appeared on Beautiful Pain alongside 2 Chains and Lloyd. You talk about her and try washing clothes and detergent. Daddy deserted, so now we serve, saying we're serving. Dreaming we had a furnace, so cold we're sleeping on the curtains. And also showed up on a track called Right Now alongside Meek Mill, Fresh Montana, and Corey Guns. Now around 2013, Drake hosted his highly anticipated OVO Fest once again. The first festival took place around 2010, with Drake getting huge cosigns from Eminem and Jay-Z when they performed. Ever since then, the festival has been a staple in Canada and is used to showcase artists in Drake's periphery. Drake brought out Mace during 2013's OVO Fest, a move that got people talking about Mace's future on OVO. Funny enough, me and Mace have just been talking about what the future holds what he wants to do. Anything is possible, man. I told Mace, you're Mace at the end of the day, so I don't think you should end up on anybody else's label. I would love to be involved, just like I know Kanye West takes an interest in Mace as well, because Mace is the original fly guy that made it all look extremely fun. Needless to say, Mace did not sign to Drake. Around this time, Mace was featured on a song called Commas with LEP Boys and Lil Wayne. From 2014 to 2017, Mace kept doing features here and there, appearing on tracks such as Tryna Wife alongside Timberland, Supreme alongside Rick Ross, Big Crit and Fabulous, Killing Em Girl alongside Slim, Four Million Dollars, and Not A Love Song alongside Eric Bellinger. He also dropped a single off his upcoming album called Nothing. She's been on the tip like she cursed the cup. She wasn't a freak, least at first she not. She Around 2014, Maze divorced his wife Twyla, a woman he had been married to for about 12 years. Maze also did quite a bit of acting, as he appeared in Netflix's Sandy Wexler as himself. Before 2017, the other role that Maze acquired was in 2005, where he played Frankie Betha in All of Us. He also had a role in All That, where he played himself. Now around 2017, Mace and Dips had reignited a beef that had been spanning for years. It all began around the time Cameron went on IG Live and attacked Mace's decision to become a pastor. See that's what Mace did. Mace went real wild. Mace said, you know what, I'm gonna just start saying I'm in church. Mace took it too far though, started preaching and all that shit. I see what he was doing with that shit. He was like, you know what, ain't gonna m harass me if I'm in church. That's what Mace did. He said, yo, they can't beef with me. They can't ask me for nothing. I'm gonna throw on the Rev Run collar and get the f out of here. That. Cameron did provide further insight into Mace's decision to become a pastor. According to the man, Mace was making so much money that he couldn't go back to the streets without the risk of a possible threat and needed to change his image in order to feel safe. Mace wasn't coming outside. That shit just got a little aggressive. You go triple platinum, Shit gonna get aggressive. He said, F it man. You know what? It's a lot of violence going on around me. I'm gonna take these chips I got and I'm going to church. And I used to be mad at him about it. But hey, I see where he's coming from. I wouldn't go that far where he went, but I see the play. I see the play. I see what he was doing. As mentioned earlier, Mace was said to be avoiding street gangster Baby Maine. Now around 2017, Cameron released an album called The Program. It contained a song called It's Killer, which had a few lines directed at Mace. Told him straight up, I ain't feeling him. Let me curve this before I end up killing him. Another line goes, I watched him play Pop Lottie against Baby Maine. At this time I'm moving in Maryland. They both died and this turned reverend. The Mace call, say yo I'm stuck inside some bitches house, I'm waiting at the door, could I hurry up and get him out? Shortly after Mace heard what Cameron had to say about him, 
he fired back in a scathing diss track called The Oracle. Mama, Dame told you do this shit and you don't see Dame Karma. K9 on your ass, nigga, no distraction. Pussy nigga wearing pink, guess he think he matching. Murder Mace was back. Not being one to back down from a beef, Cameron fired back with a good but less prominent track called Dinner Time. I ain't got a sister, only sister I fucked was yours. After this track got released, social media was the next avenue of expression. May said, you still my brother if you'd like to be. This was just for bragging rights. To which Cameron responded with, this was fun. You're still my bro too. Glad I get to brag. LOL. So when you leaving Harlem again? Tomorrow? Now despite making peace with Cameron, Mace decided to backtrack. We're not cool. I shook his hand cause I won. That's it. As a man, that's what you do after you win unanimously. Now apart from having beef with Dipset, it seems like Mace had more issues with his former bad boy boss, Puff Daddy. Around 2020, Diddy made a passionate speech about the Grammys, claiming that they don't respect hip hop artists. In the great words of Erica Badu, we are artists. We are sensitive about our shit. We are passionate. For most of us, this is all we got. This is our only hope. Truth be told, hip hop has never been respected by the Grammys. Black music has never been respected by the Grammys. In response to this wild but very true accusation, Mace had a few things to say on IG. During a long post, Mace took shots at Diddy and also made us aware that Diddy bought Mace's publishing for about 20k years ago, a sum that Mace equates to daylight robbery. At Diddy, I heard your Grammy speech about how you are now for the artist and about how the artist must take back control. So I will be the first to take that initiative. Also, before we ask of other ethnicities to do us right, we should do us as a black people better, especially the creators. I heard you loud and clear when you said that you are now for the artist. And to that, my response is, if you want to see change, you can make a change today by starting with yourself. He goes on to say, for example, you still got my publishing from 24 years ago in which you gave me 20k, which makes me never want to work with you, as any artist wouldn't after you know someone is robbing you and tarnishing your name when you don't want to comply with his horrendous business model. Mace attempted to buy back his publishing from Diddy for $2 million, however Diddy refused the offer because he had more lucrative investors, more specifically European investors. So I offered you 2 million in cash just a few days ago to sell me back my publishing. He goes on to say, Your response was if I can match what the European guy offer him, that would be the only way I can get it back. Or else I can wait until I'm 50 years old and it will revert to me back from when I was 19 years old. You bought it for about 20k and I offered you 2 million in cash. Now everybody knows Diddy has always been about his business. Mace did help Diddy build Bad Boy's brand, however at the end of the day, May still became a millionaire because of Diddy. Is Diddy wrong for trying to get more money out of a contract that both parties signed? Or is he just a smart businessman? I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. In essence, Mace is an iconic artist who obviously still does shows. However, he appears to be very selective about the shows he performs at. Where Mace got a show at? Yo fam, it's 2017. You on tour with Puff still? Come on, five. Shit is crazy. You don't gotta show anywhere doing anything music-wise. I'm not dissing him or nothing, but Mace performs a couple times a year, like Soul Train or Lady of Soul Awards and stuff like that. Now from the looks of things, it looks like Mace is still doing his pastor thing. Earlier this year, he was named the pastor of Atlantis Gathering Oasis Church, a position he took on with the greatest honor. Everyone is here on short notice. You're here on short notice. I'm here on short, no short notice. And I want to thank you so much for being here. I think there's been a major challenge within the city, like being able to direct people back to God. And I really welcome the challenge. Now Mace had an odd career. He blew up, sold a lot of units, and left the game when he was at his peak. However, when he got back into making music, his sound had changed, confusing a lot of his core fan base. After doing his thing with G-Unit, Mace became less visible as far as making music goes, but he shows up every now and then to give us a great hip-hop moment. Mace gets about 2 million monthly listeners on Spotify, and his most popular songs on the platform are Feel So Good, What You Want, and All I Ever Wanted. Well, my, my flavor of style comes from Harlem, the, the place that I was raised. And now that I live in Atlanta, it's like my style is like a mixture now. I have more that 
more of my edginess come from Atlanta because you know they're real aggressive and they're real you know throwing bowls and jumping and you know shouting and all that but you know being from Harlem I I developed like a little cool personality pretty boy a little clean cut so then when you mix them two together you got mace this week's post notification shout outs go to my man Chris Brown Syria Jenkins and Gar Tindall. Thanks for being a part of the fam and turning on your notification bell. That's it for me, man. It's your boy Ali. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. What happened to Mason, your opinion? Let me know down below. New What Happened to video dropping next week. Till next time, humble gossip.